I was raised Catholic, um, born and raised. I don't remember anything else but being uh, in church every Sunday. And I was actually, I would consider myself super Catholic. I did everything that a good Catholic should do. I would get my envelopes every year at the beginning of the year and they conveniently used to have checkbox on them. Um, it would either say five, 10, 25, maybe other. And it was like a multiple choice. So I figured, struggling college kid, I'll check the $5 one when I had it, stick it in the envelope, didn't think anything else. Um, I actually grew up in a Christian family, going to church uh, since I was just a, a very small child. And, um, you know, was blessed to be able to um, know Jesus at a, a very early age. The church I was going to was always very good about teaching us what tithing was and what it meant and, and that God's Word um, called us to do that in obedience to Him. So I would get my paycheck and I would, um, you know, write out my bills and then and spend the money on myself that I wanted to. I was always tithing what was left over and it wasn't always 10%. Um, depending on what sales were going on that week, um, <laughs> it might not have been any percent. Well, even before we got married, I was helping Nikki with her finances. I would notice that there was always an entry for um, the church, and it was always a, f a fairly large entry compared to her salary. And while she was trying to control her finances and, and get everything in line, I would always ask her, what, what's this entry for? And she would tell me that's her tithe check. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't we just pay down your bills and take care of the church later? And, and she told me, well, that's what she believes is right. That's what she's been taught her whole life. And I kind of almost shamefully mocked it. And then when um, we finally were able to get married and, and, and we're together, now came, there was gonna be some contention. We would be in the car on the way to church and um, I would say, did you remember the tithe check? And most of the time I would not get a good reaction. It was kind of snippy. Um, <laughs> kind of? Kind of snippy. When he did remember it, he wasn't pleased with the fact that I was reminding him. And a lot of times he would say, yes, I've got that check. <laughs> yes, I've got it. Stop nagging me. I've got the check. And so uh, as months went on, I would start to just not ask him. And I just thought, you know what, God? It's all your money and um, you know my heart. I want to give, but you know, my husband, who is the head of the household, is not where I'm at right now. And so I just kind of left that in God's hands and just prayed about it and said, God, I hope that there comes a day when Dennis, you know, um, understands the importance of tithing because it's what your word tells us to do and that he has joy in it, that he becomes a generous giver. Welcome everybody, so good to have you here today on all three of our campuses. And let me just say a great big thank you to Dennis and Nikki for opening up their lives and sharing a part of their story with us. And that's just part one of their story. You're gonna to get to hear part two in just a, a little while. And I just gotta tell you, this is not a good week to leave early. You're gonna to wanna to stay and hear the rest of their story because it's amazing, uh, the transformation that God brought in their perspective and where they are uh, today. Hey, this is week number two in this series called Strapped, and we chose this name for this series because we believe this word really is the best word to define how most Americans feel when it comes to their finances. Uh, even though we live in one of the wealthiest nations in the world, most people feel, you know, just strapped down and stressed out and tied down financially and also emotionally and even spiritually. And so the goal of this series is to help you to get to a better place, to help all of us get beyond the stress and the anxiety and sometimes even the guilt that we feel when it comes to money matters. So as we begin today, I want to recap something that we talked about last week. Last week I mentioned that when it comes to money, there are basically just five things that all of us do with our money. Uh, for every dollar you get, you use it in one of these five ways. Number one, we spend it, and uh, we're all pretty good at that. Uh, number two, we repay debt. Third thing we do with money is we pay taxes. Hopefully you're doing that. Fourth thing we do with money is we save for the future, and the fifth thing we can do with money is we can give it away to God or others. So everything we do with money falls into one of those five categories. Everything else is a subcategory of that. Now, I also mentioned last week when it comes to the way that we operate typically as Americans, this is our order of priority also. Like number one thing we do, we spend. 
And then the number two thing you do is you pay for the things that you already bought but couldn't afford, and that's kind of spending as well. Number three, you pay your taxes. And then number four, if there's anything left after spending, repaying debt, paying your taxes, you might sneak some into a savings account. And then finally, if you have something left every once in a while, you may give. Now, let me just put a little bit different spin on this, okay? Number one priority, me. Number two priority, me. Number three priority, America. Number four priority, me. Number five, God and others. All right, let let, let me say that again because it is kind of complicated. It goes like this. Me, me, America, which is we, me, and God. Now, do you see the problem with that system for those who claim to be followers of Christ? Now, if you're an atheist, that's really no problem at all. That makes a lot of sense. But here's the problem with that approach if you are a believer, if you're a follower of Christ. The problem is that it puts God at the very bottom of the list, which means that essentially God gets whatever is left over if there happens to be something left over. Let me illustrate this in a way that I think will be memorable for you. I brought some peanuts here with me today because I was reminded of an old story about a pastor who went to visit an older woman in his congregation, and he went to visit her in his home, and when he sat down, he noticed a jar of peanuts sitting there on the coffee table. And he said, do you mind if I have a few? And, and, and uh, the woman said, no, pastor, I don't mind at all. So they sat and they talked for about an hour, and he just kept eating the peanuts. And without even realizing it, by the time he stood up to leave, the peanut jar was entirely empty. And so he turned to the woman and he said, I am so sorry for eating all the peanuts. I only intended to eat just a few of them. And this older woman said, oh, don't worry about it, Pastor. It's all right. You know, ever since I lost my teeth, all I can do is suck the chocolate off them anyway. You'll remember that, I'm sure. But that's kind of the way we treat God sometimes with our resources. Like, we suck up everything we want We take everything we think we can use, and then whatever happens to be left over, we give that to God. Basically, we say, God, you know, here's a peanut. And I think there's a better way to live. And I want to talk about a different way of prioritizing. Today, we're going to talk about how to expand our generosity. We're going to talk about giving. And some of you say, well, Mark, you know, do you really have to talk about giving in church? Why do you want to talk about giving? I'll tell you why. It's very simple. God so loved the world that he gave. And if we are going to be like God, the way that we become like God is when we become givers. Now, if you're here today and you're a guest with us and you're not yet a follower of Christ, uh, you get the opportunity today to just chill out because this message really isn't for you. Uh, We don't really want anything from you. We just want to give something to you. We want to give you hope and joy and meaning and purpose, and you can find that in Christ. But if this is your church and if you are a follower of Christ, uh, today we're going to talk about this very important area of our lives. And today I'm going to approach the teaching a little bit different. Today I'm not going to so much tell you what to do. I'm just going to tell you what I do and why I do it. Okay? So here's what I do. I tithe. Now, if you haven't been around church much, you're thinking to yourself, you what? I tithe. Now, here's what that word means. The word tithe is a Bible word, and it's really a mathematical term. It literally means one-tenth or 10%. So tithing is when you give back to God one-tenth or 10% of what he gave to you in the first place. And so ever since Debbie and I have been married, it has been our practice to give back to God at least 10% of what he gives to us. In fact, in the very early days of our marriage, when I first started working at the church, my income was so low that we qualified for food stamps. Uh, Literally, I'm not making that up. And even in those days, it was our practice, it was our habit to tithe from our income. Now, why am I sharing that with you? Uh, am I sharing that to brag? Not at all. I'm sharing that in an effort to be transparent and to begin a conversation over these next 30 minutes about why I would ever do something like that. Because here's what I realize. The vast majority of people in our culture who would hear me say that would say, you are crazy. Why in the world would you ever give away without being required to? Why would you give away 10% of your income? I mean, that's nuts. And the truth is, 
A bunch of you in this church think that way as well. You just think that's kind of crazy. And so today, I just want to explain why we do that. And after I explain why we do that, you can go home today, you can talk about me, and you can decide whether or not I am indeed crazy. So it all boils down to this. Uh, I want to tell you a principle that I've discovered when it comes to giving. And everything that I say in this message, I think, could be wrapped around this one simple principle. And when you leave here today, I hope you remember this, if nothing else. It's this, that giving is not God's way of raising money. It is his way of raising his children. Now, certainly God uses what we give to him to make an impact in this world. He leverages that for eternal purposes. There is no doubt about that. But in that transaction, there is something that happens in our hearts when we give. That giving is not just God's way of raising money. It's also God's way of raising his children. And we're going to talk about that. Before I jump into that idea, let me just walk you through the history behind the practice of tithing. I'm going to begin in the book of Genesis here, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. So I'm going to begin in the book of Genesis chapter 14, and this is the story of Abraham, one of the main characters in the Bible. And at this point in the story, here's the background, the backstory. Abraham's nephew Lot had been taken captive. And so Abraham rounds up 318 of his friends and he goes into battle and he wins this battle against unbelievable odds and he rescues his nephew, Lot. So here's what happens next. Verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. I want to stop there because this is just really fascinating to me. This guy, Melchizedek, kind of mysterious. He shows up in the Bible here, and then you never read about him again after this. But it's descri- it, he's described here as the king of Salem. And, and, and the word Salem, it literally means peace. And so Melchizedek here is described as the king of peace. Do you know what's so interesting to me? One of the titles given to Jesus was prince of peace. And it says here that he brought out bread and wine. Do you remember that on the night before Jesus was crucified, he brought out bread and wine. And it also says here that Melchizedek was a priest of God most high. And several times in the New Testament, Jesus himself is described as our high priest. I mean, the parallels here are just absolutely amazing. But listen to what he says. And and he blessed Abram. This was Uh, the name Abraham had before it was Abraham. His name got changed. He was called Abram previously. And he blessed Abram saying, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. In other words, Abram, I just want you to understand that you only won that battle because God was fighting for you. And then here's what happened next. It says, then Abram gave him a tenth or a tithe of everything. So that's the very first mention of tithing, 14 chapters into the Bible. Now let me draw a parallel here. If you're a follower of Christ, someone has already won a great battle for you. You've been given a great victory, victory over sin and your shame and your past and even death itself. Let's keep reading, and, and I could give a number of examples. I'm just going to move quickly. By the time you get to Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, tithing becomes codified into the laws of the nation of Israel. Chapter 27, verse 30, it says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It's His. It is holy to the Lord. A little bit later in the Old Testament, you come to a book called Second Chronicles. Chronicle just means history. So this is a part of the, the history of the Jewish people. This is a revival that's just taken place. And it says, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, oil, and honey. In all that the fields produced, they brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. So they took all their income, which was not measured in dollars and cents, but in crops and herds, and they gave a tenth of that. They keep reading. Come to the New Testament where Jesus twice speaks about this practice of tithing. I'll mention just one of those. He says this, Matthew 23, he's addressing the religious leaders and he's calling them out on their hypocrisy. And he says this, you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Now, by the way, if that were the only verse in the Bible, for me, that would be enough. 
because I'm a follower of Christ who said you should tithe. And so it seems very clear in Scripture that for God's people, there was this pattern of tithing, of giving back to God 10% of what he had given to them originally. Now, I want to tell you why I practice tithing. Uh, Number one, I do so because I think it's just a step of obedience, but ever since I've started doing that, uh, I have found some other reasons that just kind of amplify my commitment to it. Here's number one. I tithe because I believe it is a powerful act of worship. In other words, giving can become a very powerful, tangible recognition of God's rightful place in my life. Now, I want to go back to Scripture, and I'm going to spend the remainder of our time in one book of the Bible. It's called Malachi. It's in what we call the Old Testament, very last book of the Old Testament. And Malachi was a Jewish prophet. By the way, it's Malachi, not Malachi, the Italian prophet. It's Malachi. And Malachi, his job as a prophet was to bring the message of God to the people of God. But his message to God's people was very strong. It was a strong rebuke because their hearts had grown cold and their faith was dead. And the way that was shown most clearly was in the fact that they were just giving God the peanuts, the leftovers, the stuff that they didn't even want anymore. Look at Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. This is him speaking on behalf of God to God's people. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. Very strong words. Verse 8 gives the reason why there were these strong words. It says, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. You see what was happening there, don't you? When it came time for them to bring an offering, a sacrifice to the temple, they would go throughout their herd and they would look at their animals and they would keep the strong, healthy animals for themselves. And they would find the ones that were lame or blind or had no real market value and they would give those. But in doing so, they were making a statement about how much they really respected God. Today, we don't have flocks and herds. We don't have pastures. We have wallets, checkbooks, and we have bank accounts. And when we pull from them to give to God, we are making a statement of worship about how much we respect him. And I shared these statistics, or at least one of them, last week. According to the most recent research, the average Christian household gives 1.9% of its income to charitable causes. That's church, uh, charities, everything. And 20%, one in five of all U.S. Christians give nothing, zero, nada, zilch, to any church or non-religious charity. So 20% of the people who believe God so loved the world that he gave don't give. It's mind-boggling. So basically here what many, many Christians say, they say, God, thank you. Thank you so much for my life, my health. God, thank you for my family. Thank you for my home. Thank you for my three cars and my other home. And God, thank you for saving me and for giving me and, and, and giving me a future. God, thank you so much. God, have some peanuts. Essentially, That's what we do. And one of the reasons why I tithe is because I know I need to remind myself on a regular basis of God's rightful place in my life that he deserves my very best. And when I give, it's a powerful reminder of that. Now, Debbie and I give online. So what happens is every two weeks, I get an email with a contribution receipt. And I have this quirky little habit that I I do. Every two weeks when that email comes, I click on it, I open it, and I read it. I already know what it says. It says, thank you for your contribution to the mission of Parker Hill Community Church, helping people find the way back to God. And then there's a scripture verse under it, and it's signed by me, actually. Um, But I still read it every single week, every two weeks when it comes. I click on it and read it. Do you know why? For me, it's a moment of worship. It's a moment of perspective. It's a moment when I remind myself that I follow a God who deserves my very best. And when I give, and when I realize what I'm giving, man, that puts everything else in perspective. So I tithe because for me, it's a profound act of worship. I'll tell you the second reason why I tithe. I tithe because for me, it draws me closer 
to God, and I believe this is true for everyone. Skip ahead now to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, again, he's speaking to the people of God on behalf of God. It says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Again, the people of Israel had drifted far from God. Their relationship with God had grown cold. God is saying it's not too late. If you turn and start walking toward me, I'll run toward you. You return to me, I'll return to you. He goes on to say, but you ask, how are we to return? In other words, the people are saying, God, how can we mend this relationship? How can we bring our lives back into sync with you, back into harmony with you? Do we need to pray more? Do we need to worship more? Do we need to read the scriptures more? God, what do we need to do? How do we return to you? Keep reading. Here's the answer. It may surprise you. Verse 8, he says, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Listen to this. Bring the whole tithe. In, In other words, God says to his people, hey, return to me. If you want to restore this relationship, if you want to experience intimacy with me, if you want to return, here's how to do it. Return the whole tithe. Here, you know what I've discovered? I have discovered that the very act of giving, for some mysterious reason for me, it draws my heart toward the heart of God. It does. But I shouldn't be surprised at that because here's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, 21, he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, your heart always gets connected to wherever your money goes. There is no way around that. Your heart always follows your treasure. It does. I mean, you take your entire, entire retirement portfolio and you invest that in Apple computer stock. Let me tell you what, your heart is going to be connected to Apple. You're going to be watching every news report about that company. You're going to, reading their profit, you're going to be reading their profit and loss statements. Your heart always follows your treasure. You dump all your money into a brand new car, your dream car. Let me tell you what, you're going to have a heart connection to that car. And the first time some kid with a shopping cart puts a scratch in it, you're going to mourn. You're going to go through the five stages of grief because your heart always follows your treasure. You know what I've discovered? That when I give, my heart follows my treasure and I become more and more connected to the heart of God. And I see this, lo- this world differently. I see this world through his eyes and, and a little bit less through my own eyes. And it changes me. It makes me into a different person. And I think that's true with everybody because giving in and of itself is a very unselfish act. And I think it makes you a more unselfish person, makes you a better person. See, you might think, you know what? You're right, Mark. I need to give because God needs my money. No, he doesn't. He really doesn't. But here's what God knows. He knows your heart will follow your money. And he doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. He wants your devotion. He wants your love. And Jesus said, wherever your treasure goes, your heart is just going to follow. And I've discovered that when I tithe, it just draws my heart to God in a powerful way. See, giving is not just God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising his children. Third reason, I I tithe because God gave it to me in the first place. (laughs) He really did. There's a word here in this passage that really struck me for the first time as I read it this time. I don't think I've ever paid much attention to this word before. It's the word here in verse 10. It's the word bring. You see it there, it says bring the whole tithe. It doesn't say give, it says bring. And I I think that word is used very intentionally because there's a difference between giving something and bringing something. To give something implies that you own it and you're giving it over to someone else. To bring something implies that you don't really own it, you just had it for a while and now you're bringing it back. And and I think there's a a point to be made here. And let me illustrate it this way. Um, When Debbie and I, a few years ago, went to Florida, we flew out of the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Airport. But I didn't want to pay for parking for seven to ten days, so I didn't leave my vehicle there. What I did was I had my nephew drive us to the airport and drop us off, and then he came back to pick us up when our flight came back in at the end of vacation. And during the time that we were gone, he had the privilege of using my vehicle. He was allowed to drive it anytime he wanted. So imagine this. Imagine we get back from Florida. We land. We go out. We get in the car. And he says this. He says, Uncle Mark, Aunt Debbie, I've been thinking about this. I've been praying about this. And I just want you to know, I've decided to give you this car. I, I just, I'm giving it to you. I just want to give it to you. 
To which I would say, dude, listen, um, I appreciate the sentiment behind that, but you can't give me what's already mine. See, you can bring me my car back, but you can't give me my car. And, and this little word bring, I think it points to a fundamental reality of life that we ultimately don't own anything. That God ultimately owns everything and we just bring back to him what was his in the first place and he just let us have for a while. Let me, let me trace this theme with you through, through a few verses in the Bible, like Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. To the Lord our God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it, it's all his. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. See, since God ultimately owns it all, when we give, we're not really giving, we're just bringing back to him what was his in the first place, and it's so important to understand this. See, let me tell you something. If you're someone that others would look at and they would see you as having some financial success in this world. Or if you see yourself that way. Let me tell you what one of the greatest dangers is in your life. One of the greatest dangers in your heart is pride. Self-sufficiency. Beginning to think you got it all figured out. Beginning to think that you got there on your own. Let me tell you what. You didn't. And I don't know about you, but for me, every time I give, it's a reminder that it wasn't mine to begin with. That God owns it all, and that's why he has a right to that first part that I give back to him. And, and the only reason I have anything is by his grace, because he gave it to me in the first place. You see, giving is not just way, God's way of raising money, it's God's way of raising his children. And when we give, it raises our perspective to him and reminds us that he is Lord and he owns it all. Number four, fourth reason I tithe is because the church is the hope of the world. I believe that the church is the hope of the world. Look at verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Let me explain that a little bit. Uh, the storehouse was actually part of the Jewish temple. See, you have to remember that was an agricultural society. So when they gave, when they gave a tithe, they didn't write a check or bring cash. They brought their crops. They brought grain. And so the storehouse was literally a place to store the tithes of the people. And so what would happen with the grain that they gave is that that grain would be used to feed the priests and the Levite, who, Levites who oversaw the worship of the Jewish people. Some of that grain would be used to feed people in need. Some of it would be sold off or it would be traded for other things that were needed to keep the, the, the spiritual life of the people of Israel moving forward. But here was the problem in Malachi's day. The problem was this. God's people weren't giving, and because they weren't giving, God's house was empty. And because God's house was empty, God's kingdom could not be advanced. Worship could not be conducted. And because God's kingdom could not be advanced, even that society and the culture itself was beginning to deteriorate. Okay, so let me connect some dots for you. The temple was the focal point of God's presence in the world at that time. The church is the focal point of God's presence in the world at this time. The church is called the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Christ. We are the expression of God's presence in this world at this time. And here's what's happened in our culture. Because God's people don't give, the work of his kingdom can't move forward. And because the work of God's kingdom can't move forward, our culture has begun to deteriorate and to decline. And if I had more time, I would give a, a thorough explanation from the Bible about why I believe that our giving should be primarily focused on giving to the church. Now, that may bother some of you. And you may think, you know, well, Mark, I don't think you should come right out and ask people to give money to the church. Uh, that doesn't seem very comfortable to me. Let me tell you this. I have no problem asking you to give money to the church because I think it is the greatest investment in the world. The church is the hope of the world. The church is the bride of Christ. The church has been around for 2,000 years and it will outlast any human organization. The church is the carrier of the only message of hope this world ever will hear. I really believe that. See, I don't believe that Barack Obama is the hope of the world. I don't believe that the Republican Party is the hope of the world. I don't believe that the Red Cross, the United Way, or the Peace Corps is the hope of the world. I believe that the church is the hope of the world. And more specifically, I believe in this church. I believe in you. I believe in our leaders. I believe in our staff. I believe in this mission. And so when I give, I give joyfully 
because I believe the church is the hope of the world. Now, and let me acknowledge a bit of tension right now, because some of you are probably thinking this. You're thinking, you know, that guy up front, he's telling me that I need to give to the organization that he leads. Like, that's a little bit suspect, okay? And I get that, especially if you don't know me from Adam. No reason you should trust me. And I get that, why you might be a little bit suspicious. So here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I'm going to encourage you to do this. Start tithing. Give it to a different church. I'll give you a couple names. You just walk in and you start writing checks, they'll be blown away. They, don't, they won't even know what happened. And, and I mean that. Now, you, you Don't give it here. If you, if you can't give here, give somewhere else because I would rather have you be a fully devoted follower of Christ than have a dime from your wallet. I mean that. But give to a church somewhere because I believe the church is the hope of the world. Uh, let me take that a step further and just say this. If, if this isn't a church that, that you can be all in with, if this isn't a church that you can fully support and you're here, I'd say find another church. And I don't say that out of anger. I say that out of love because I want you to be in a church where you can be all in on the mission and fully bought in and you can give because when you give, your heart will change because giving isn't just God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising his children. And reason number five, here's why I tithe. Not only because I know God calls me to do that, but because I know that God will take care of my needs when I do. And I love this last part of verse 10. Listen to the first four words. Test me in this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. God says, go ahead. Test me. I dare you. I double dog, double sheep, double camel, whatever, dare you try me. You follow me. You make me first in your life. You stop giving me the peanuts. You put me at the top of your priority list, and you watch how I'll take care of your needs. And I'll tell you what, I can testify from 20-some years of making this a habit of my life that this is true. It is true. It's been amazing at some seasons in our life how God has come through for, for our family in ways that I never would have expected. Now, let me be very clear. This promise in Malachi chapter 3 was a promise that was made to the nation of Israel. It was not made to the United States. And it was not made to you or I specifically. But let me say this, this promise that was given to Israel reflects a principle that you see all throughout Scripture. That when we put God first in our lives, His favor is upon us. His blessing is upon us. I'll just give you one other example right from the lips of Jesus Himself. In Matthew chapter 6, in the context here, he's speaking about material things and all the stuff we worry about every day and run after like clothes and food and shelter. And he, and he says this, he says, seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom. Seek that first, put that at the top of the list. And his righteousness and all these material things will be given to you as well. You put God's kingdom first and he will bless you. Over and over in scripture, God says, listen, you, you put me first in your life, you give me first place, you won't be disappointed. Now, let me tell you what this is not talking about. This is not talking about something that's commonly called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says that we give so we can get from God. Like we give so that we can get the BMW. We give so that we can get the new outfit and the hairdo and the whatever. No. God is not a pinata that we hit with enough prayers and enough giving that finally it breaks and we get all kinds of wonderful prizes. No, it's not about giving so we will get. We give because we have already received so much. We give not as a way to put a coin in a vending machine. We give in response to what we've already been given so graciously. But the promise is when we do this, our needs are always going to be met. And in the process of seeing that happen, trust is built and that relationship grows stronger with our Heavenly Father who provides for us. Because listen, giving isn't just God's way of raising money. It's God's way of raising His children and creating a trust relationship with us. So, how do you apply all this? Let me tell you what, the application this week is incredibly, incredibly simple. In fact, it just comes down to one word. But before I get to that word, let, let, me, let me just acknowledge something. I'll bet there are hundreds of you hearing this message that you want so badly to be generous. 
You want to be able to write that check and bless somebody. You want to be able to support a child somewhere in another part of the world. You want to be part of what your church is doing in this world, but you're so strapped, you're so upside down financially that you can't even imagine how you could do that. Listen, we don't want you to live that way any longer. And coming up this Saturday, we're offering a free two-hour class called the Financial Learning Experience. It tells you on the card how to register for that, parkerhill.org slash F-L-E, free. Free booklet comes with it, free child care, free continental breakfast. We're not going to be selling timeshares or anything like that. It's absolutely free, no pressure, no obligation. It's simply to help you. Take advantage of that because we don't want to see you strapped a year from now, two years from now. We want you to get out of that, okay? But even so, I'm going to give you and everybody else a challenge. It's a very simple challenge. Tithe. Try it. God said, test me in this. In fact, here's how we're going to do it. Next Sunday, we're going to invite everyone who calls this their church, Parker Hill Community Church, their church, to participate in something really simple. It's called the 30-Day Tithe Challenge. It's based on those words from Malachi 3.10 where God says, test me in this. See what happens. So here's the challenge. For one month, for one month, beginning right after Thanksgiving or around Thanksgiving, for one month, put God first in your life. Give him a tithe of your income. See what happens. Not one year, not six months, not even three months, 30 days. Now, obviously, the goal is to create a habit pattern in your life and and for that to be a part of your life because God, I believe, that's a, a step of obedience. But here's the way that you can do exactly what God says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. You can test him in this 30 day tithe challenge beginning next Sunday, okay? And we're going to give you a little card to fill out, and we'll talk you through it. It's real simple, but uh, you want to be a part of that. Now, some of you, no big deal, you already do that. In fact, if you tithe, you're actually going to go backwards because you give like probably 12, 15% like some of us do. But if, if you're in that category, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're the reason we can do so much for so many other people. But if you're not yet in that category of someone who lives this way, we're going to give you 30 days to try this. And ultimately, it's not about the money. It isn't. It's about what God wants to do in your heart because giving is not just God's way of raising money. It's his way of raising his children. So we're gonna do that next week. And some of you say, well, okay, Mark, what's your real agenda? (laughs) What's the real agenda behind doing this? Are we facing some kind of financial crisis in the church? No, we are not. And we'll do fine if you don't give. Here's my agenda. My agenda is I want this church to be all it can be. And I want every person in this church to be all that God wants them to be. And I want us to break the bonds of materialism. And I want us to live with God first in our lives because I know it changes us from the inside out. I can testify to that. And I want us to start doing this and just stand back and be amazed at what God can do in our presence. So be sure to come back next week. As we wrap up today, I want you to hear the rest of Dennis and Nikki's story And we had a great time talking to them this past week. Wish you could have heard the entire interview, but uh, let me just let you hear another three or four minutes of their story. Watch this with me. In the summer of 2012, we um, we were carrying two mortgages at the point for some personal reasons. And the two mortgages, we couldn't sell the house for like five years. We put the house on the market at the worst time ever. It was 2007 and the market fell out and we tried to rent it and renting became a disaster. And I said, you know, everything's going wrong right now. I heard a sermon on Malachi 3. It says that you've been stealing from me. And you ask, why, what are you keeping from me? And God says, you've kept what is mine. You should be giving to me. Put me to the test. Give me your tithes so that I can fill up my storehouses. And I will show you that I will open those storehouses to you abundantly. And I heard that and I went home that evening and I prayed and I said, can you please show me? I'll put you to the test. The pastor said it, I'll try it. And I never never heard that before. In growing up Catholic, I heard his God almighty, fire brimstone, how dare you test him? And I said, I know I've been keeping the money from you, God. I have not held up my end of the bargain. I've now learned your word over the last few years. I've heard it and I'm still not giving you your side of it and what you have given to me. I'm not being a good steward with your money. So 
I'm going to. I promise you, you give me this money or, or show me you're there. I will change my ways. So the next day, Nikki and I and our, our kids, um, we were in Dorney Park and my phone rang, just like any other time. And I picked up the phone, I didn't know the number, and I answered it and I said, and they said, Dennis, it's your realtor. We have great news. We have an offer on your home. And I stopped my, in my tracks and Nikki kept walking and I know I was white as a ghost. That was the moment that I needed. And I now look back in my old ways, I would have seen that God answered a financial problem. He answered a me problem. On that day, he saved me. After we had gone through the process of the closing and everything, he came to me and he said, you know, uh, technically, we're gonna, we're gonna tithe on the proceeds from the house, the profit. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and behind the scenes, I'm laughing, you know, going, thank you, Lord, that you're, you're, you've answered prayer. But I'm, and I, I just said to him, you know what, you're right. I think, I think you're right. It is the most tangible way to remind me that I've been saved and that there's been a big price paid for my soul. If God changed my heart on some of these things, then he could change anyone's heart because when it came to logic and finances, I was set in my ways. And now I look and I think, boy, I'm the exact person that I used to challenge and say, why do you believe that way? And now I'm that person. Once we made the commitment uh, together as a couple to start tithing the first fruits, 10% of our first fruits, yes. um, the blessings, I can't even count them all. I wouldn't be who I am now. I, I wouldn't be part of a small group and serving here and doing all that I, I've done and enjoying every moment of it if I just didn't take that first step and trust. And I was blessed that he showed me one day. Mm -hmm. It's made all the difference in our marriage mm -hmm. and in me personally.